this up one more time so the cursor works. Okay, uh, good. Can we all see the screen? Okay, yes, we can. So mm -hmm. I think we can we can start. So it's a great pleasure to introduce Justin Kaidi, a former PhD student from UCLA and now postdoc in Stony Brook. And uh, he will uh, tell us some adventures in Wonderland, namely non supersymmetric string theory. So thank you very much. Please go great. ahead. So thanks to the organizers for having me. It's a pleasure to be virtually in France, and hopefully one day soon also physically in France. <laughs> Uh, so today I want to talk about two uh, different sets of works. One is a pair of two papers that I had out in collaboration with Julio Parra Martinez, who's a postdoc at Caltech, and Yuji Tachikawa. And the other one is a slightly more recent work. So they're actually on somewhat different topics, but broadly speaking, they're both about the topic of non-supersymmetric string theory. And here by non-supersymmetric string theory, I don't mean our old friend, the bosonic string, but rather I mean super string theories which don't have space-time supersymmetry. Okay, so let me set the stage with just a little bit of motivation and ancient history here. So back in the late 80s, uh, during the time of the second super string revolution, it was realized that the various supersymmetric string theories that we know and love are just different limits of a single underlying theory. And so this gives us this famous picture of the duality web where I have some one underlying theory here and the perturbative type 2a, type 2b, type 1, et cetera strings are just different descriptions of uh, points in the moduli space of this one underlying theory. So this is of course a great scientific triumph but also in a sense uh, a great philosophical triumph I think that the idea that there's one unique fundamental theory is probably something that resonates with a lot of us. But actually at first glance, this nice philosophy seems to have some flaws. For example, it's long been known that in addition to the familiar supersymmetric strings, there are also various non-supersymmetric string theories. So the most famous of these are the type zero theories, type zero A and type zero B. These are basically the same as type 2a and type 2b on the world sheet, and they just have a different GSO projection, which gives rise to a non-supersymmetric space-time spectrum. There are also some unoriented versions of the type 0 theories, and in fact the precise number of these was not known in the literature until fairly recently, so I'll have comments about that. And there are also some non-supersymmetric heterotic string theories as well. In particular there are seven of them, in comparison to the two supersymmetric heterotic strings. Okay, so there exist these non-supersymmetric string theories and by and large- no, Sorry, you are, you are discussing now non-supersymmetric theories in 10 non-compact dimensions, right? Yes. Okay. That's right. mm -hmm. So these are all 10 dimensional strings indeed. Uh, good. And these theories have by and large remained uh, outside of the usual duality web, okay? So, uh, right, this is some stuff which hasn't yet been unified with the other familiar superstring theories. And in fact, to make matters worse, there exists string theories which are intrinsically in lower dimensions, not 10. Uh, so for example, there are 2D versions of basically all of these theories that I just talked about, 2D type zero, and there are some 2D heterotic strings as well, in particular, this is a somewhat important number that we'll come back to. There are three 2D heterotic strings in comparison to the seven non-SUSY 10D heterotic strings and the two SUSY ones. Okay, so uh, we seem sorry, to have a well- Sorry, I thought that the heterotic theories were connected by dualities by Dines and collaborators. Isn't this correct? So there, there certainly do exist connections. So uh, in the heterotic string case, yes, and maybe I should have put more references. But um, right, so the goal of this talk is going to be to provide more connections, for example, from this 2D branch to this 10D branch. And so I won't have much to say about connecting this to this, but there do exist some, though sparse, works in the literature. Thank you. 
Great. Um, okay, good. So, excuse me. Uh, do yes. you speak about uh, uh, non-critical strings? Yes. Yes, uh, oh, that's yeah. right. Well, these two D strings, for example. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay, the old story. Yes, I see. Uh, good. Okay, so the general philosophy of this talk today is maybe a somewhat controversial one, but I'm going to take the point of view that string theory is a maybe the unique theory of quantum gravity, and hence. If these sort of perturbative regimes here actually correspond to consistent theories, I would expect that they should all be unified under one sort of duality web. It, maybe it's not just S and T duality, which is going between these. It's certainly not going to be generally, but there should be some connection between all of this. Okay, good. So having said that, let's uh, proceed. So. It's important that these regimes should be consistent, right? If I have some non-consistence theory, I don't want it to be put into this duality web. And it's sometimes colloquially said that the non-supersymmetric 10D string theories are not consistent because they have a closed string tachyon. Actually, there are some exceptions here where there aren't closed string tachyons. To the best of my knowledge, there are three such theories. But by and large, they all have closed string tachyons and one might be worried about the existence of such tachyons. But actually the presence of a tachyon does not itself mean that the theory is inconsistent. It just means that we're expanding around, around the wrong vacuum. Okay? So the perturbative string should not be interpreted as describing fluctuations about the usual vacuum, which for us is 10D Minkowski space but rather as expansions around some other uh, actual stable vacuum. And so as long as the theory admits one stable vacuum, the theory should be considered consistent and then should by the previous philosophy be brought into the duality web. Okay, so what we're going to do is we're going to look for stable vacua of uh, theories with tachyons. And one of the nice features that we'll see is that the stable vacua can often be lower dimensional this is something that's actually already been observed. It's not a new thing. And in many cases, we'll see that these uh, stable lower dimensional vacua are actually two-dimensional string theories. Okay, and this will provide some nice connections between, for example, so type 0a will admit as a stable vacuum the 2D type 0a theory, which is stable. Um, okay, so that will provide some connections between those theories. Sorry, okay. why, why do these string theories, why is it sufficient to have a stable vacuum? Doesn't a string theory need to be uh, non-perturbatively stable? So, yes, yeah, so you mean state, well, so you mean stable versus metastable? Yes. Yes, so ideally you would like a actual stable vacuum um, and I won't be able to prove that the vacua I identify are actually stable as opposed to metastable. But yes, hopefully this is one step in, in that direction. Great. Okay. So um, I think that's it for the motivation here. So what's the goal of the talk? The goal of the talk is going to be to classify non-supersymmetric 10D string theories, and then to find stable vacua for them. Okay. Now this is a bit ambitious for a one hour talk. So instead I'm going to illustrate the classification and the stable vacua parts by means of two simple examples. So in part one of the talk, we're gonna study classification in the context of the unoriented type zero strings. Okay, so that was this piece here. And then in part two of the talk, we're going to find stable vacua in the case of non-supersymmetric heterotic strings. Okay, that's these guys here. Uh, can I ask a question here? Yeah. Um, I vaguely remember that in the 90s, Keith Deans again and collaborators uh, using the fermionic formulation constructed thousands of four-dimensional heterotic vacua without tachyons and non-supersymmetric. How do these things fit in what you're describing here? Yes, so there are a wealth of four-dimensional theories indeed that I haven't added here. And unfortunately, I'm not going to have anything to, to say about those. 
So none of the theories uh, over here are going to condense down to those vacuoli. So they're separate from those vacuoli. Um, and yeah, I have not done any uh, thorough study of, of what happens to those vacuoli. I, I think by and large, those theories are not tachyonic, which is what you might've just said. So in that case, this question of a stable vacuum or metastable vacuum is sort of a moot point. Also, when you say condense, is it, does it mean that the vacuum energy of your new stable vacuum is below the vacuum energy of your original um, non unstable vacuum? This is, um, no, not necessarily the case. So then condense is maybe not the, not the right word, right? I mean, you might. There is no energy in gravitational theory. So the notion of, you know, going to a low energy state doesn't exist. What I mean by condense here is that we're going to generate a potential for the tachyon. And that potential for the tachyon will end up giving a mass to some of the spatial coordinates, which we can then integrate out and get a theory on the world sheet, which does not have tachyons. Well, I, I didn't understand uh, Elias's comment. I mean, um, you could go from a Minkowski vacuum to an anti deciter vacuum, for instance, and w wouldn't you call that maybe lowering the energy or? Uh, discuss this uh, at the end, but uh, as you know, there is only boundary energy you can define in gravity. Okay. Um, good. Okay. So, um, so if there are no other questions, I'll proceed to, to part one of the talk. Is that okay? Please do. Okay. So we're going to now talk about how to classify uh, various string theories with uh, our end goal being to classify the unoriented type zero strings. Okay, so I'm just going to, uh, on this slide, review a little bit more of the basics. So throughout this talk, we're going to be working in the NSR formalism and in light cone gauge, which means that the world sheet content of our theory is going to be some left and right moving bosons, or left and right moving super partners, and there'll be eight of each. Now, the spectrum of the physical string is obtained from that of the NSR string by doing a so-called GSO projection. Remember, a GSO projection is some projection of the state space of this theory onto some subsector, which satisfies various nice properties like closure of OPEs, mutual locality, modular invariance, and so on. So a nice sort of geometric or maybe topological way of understanding the GSO projection is to think of it as a sum over spin structures. And in this point of view, the different GSO projections correspond to different ways of assigning phases to the sum over spin structure. Okay, so let's illustrate this by means of the example of type 2a and type 2b. So the these two theories differ by GSO projection and uh, we can exhibit this by looking at the torus partition function. So here I have a, a sum over the left moving spin structures and the right moving spin structures. So I guess just to be clear what these, so these boxes obviously represent tori and the default box is in the NSNS sector. It has anti-periodic, anti-periodic boundary conditions. And now if I insert a line here, what this line represents is an insertion of a minus one to the F topological defect line. So. If I now move a fermion along the cycle of the torus, I get the default minus sign from the antiperiodicity, and then also an extra minus sign from minus one to the F for a total of a plus sign. So this is supposed to represent the RNS torus. And likewise, this is NSR and RR. Okay, so that's all this notation here means. So here I'm just summing over spin structures. And for type 2b, importantly, there's separate left and right moving spin structures. Sorry, I mean for type 2 in general. Okay, good. So um, here I've added some additional phases. So the different GSO projections correspond to different possible consistent choices of these phases. And as it turns out, um, one can show and was shown in the old days that 
um, the phases in the NS, NS, NSR, and R, NS sector all have to be one, at least up to some overall factor. And the only freedom is to choose in the RR sector a plus or minus sign. And this difference uh, between the plus and minus signs gives us the difference between type 2A and type 2B. Okay, so this is the classic GSO projection story. And now I want to give a slight new age, uh, fancy condensed matter reinterpretation of this GSO projection. And it's going to have, uh, it's gonna be nice and generalizable to other more complicated situations. Okay, so I'm going to reinterpret the GSO projection in terms of SPT phases where SPT here stands for symmetry protected topological phase. All right, so what is an SPT phase? For our purposes, an SPT phase is just a gapped theory, which has a unique ground state on any manifold without boundary. Okay, so given a manifold X, which has no boundary, the partition function of the SPT on X is just an element of U1. It has modulus one representing the fact that it has a unique ground state. Okay, so the SPT phase takes a manifold X without boundary and spits out uh, an element of U1. And in fact, the SPT doesn't actually depend on the manifold X itself, but rather only on the Bordism class of X. So let me just briefly recall for you what uh, the concept of Bordisms is. So given a manifold X1, it's said to be bordant to a manifold X2 if there admits some manifold in one higher dimension. So let's say these are d-dimensional. So they're bordant if there exists a d plus one dimensional manifold, which has x1 and x2 as its boundary. Okay. We can also talk about bordisms between manifolds with some certain structure. So for example, some spin structure or a pin structure, et cetera. Let me just call that S. There can also be some extra g principal bundle, say, over the manifold. So I can talk about bordisms between manifolds equipped with this structure, where again, I have some D plus one dimensional interpolating manifold, and I should be able to extend this structure in some appropriately smooth way. Okay, so these bordisms give rise to some sort of equivalence relation between two manifolds. And then I can talk about equivalence classes of manifolds up to bordism. Okay, and the set of those equivalence classes actually forms a group, which is known as the Bordism group, and it's denoted as shown here. Okay, so D is the dimension of the manifolds, S is the structure of the tangent bundle, G is structure of some extra potential G principal bundle that I have. So the SPT gives a map from the Bordism group to U1, and thus if we want to classify D-dimensional SPT phases, protected by some symmetry G, all I have to do is I have to compute the Petragon dual Bordism group. That is to say the group of homomorphisms from the Bordism group to U1. Okay, so the takeaway from the slide is that there exist these things called SPT phases and they're mathematically easy to classify. Okay, I should say that everything on the slide uh, about Z being in U1 is in the, for a manifold without boundary. If there is a boundary, then we can have some interesting gapless edge modes living on that boundary. And that will give us um, some important results that we'll see in a moment. So because that stuff might have been a little bit abstract, I want to bring it down to earth and give you a concrete example of these SPT phases. So in particular, I'm going to talk about the Kataev chain, also called the Majorana wire. And this is in fact so down to earth and concrete that this system has been experimentally realized. So people have literally built this thing in the lab. And the sort of beautiful thing is actually, it's exactly this system, this concrete system, that is the difference between type 2A and type 2B. Okay, so I now want to tell you about this extraordinarily sort of, I guess I shouldn't say low brow, but uh, extremely concrete condensed matter type system. Okay, and to be really concrete, I've decided um, on this blank slide here to just do everything by hand, just to show you that it's completely analyzable by hand. So what does a condensed matter do to study the Kadaev chain in the lab? 
So what a condensed matter experimentalist would do is they would build a lattice, like shown, some 1D lattice. Okay, I have some lattice points here, let's say one through N, and each site on this lattice can be occupied by an electron or not occupied. Okay, so for every site, let's say site I, I have some Dirac creation and annihilation operators. They satisfy some usual anti-commutation relations. And there's some occupation number associated to the site I, Fi dagger Fi, which is zero or one. All right. Now what I'm going to do is I'm going to change uh, my basis of creation and annihilation operators. So I'm going to do a Bogoliabov transformation, in other words, to a basis of creation and annihilation operators, CI and DI. Right, and likewise, FI dagger here is CI minus I DI. Okay, so clearly from these definitions, CI dagger is equal to CI and DI dagger is equal to DI. So what we've done here, at least formally, is we've taken every site, one, two, dot, 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 n, and we split it up into two sites, okay, which can be occupied by uh, Majorana fermions now with the respective creation operators C1 and D1 here, and here the two sites are C2 and D2, and likewise here, CN and D1. Uh, sorry, so the Majorana is the fermion which is, let's say, generated only by CI, is that the? Yes, correct. Okay. So yeah, so the Majorana is, uh, so the, I've split every Dirac site up into two Majorana sites with the corresponding creation operators being C and D. Great, okay. So uh, we now look, it now seems like we have some chain of Majoranas, hence the name the Majorana chain. And I'm now going to write down two different Hamiltonians for this lattice system, one of which I will claim describes the trivial phase, and one of which I will uh, claim describes the topologically non-trivial phase. Okay. Oh, and, and before doing that, let me just point out the obvious fact that, so the occupation number Fi dagger Fi can be rewritten just using the definitions above as one half one plus I Ci Di. And since this thing was zero or one, we conclude that I C I D I is plus or minus one. Okay, good. So uh, now I'm going to write down those Hamiltonians for you. So let me begin with the trivial phase. So the trivial phase corresponds to the following Hamiltonian. Okay, so pictorially what this Hamiltonian does is it links up C1 with D1, C2 with D2, dot, 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 Cn to Dn. Okay, and now let me write down the topologically non-trivial Hamiltonian. So let me copy and paste this lattice here. Copy, paste. Okay. And so the new Hamiltonian that I'm going to write couples di plus one to, sorry, di to ci plus one. All right, so what this looks like pictorially is I'm uh, coupling neighboring lattice lights as shown here. Okay, and so why is one of these topologically trivial and why is one of them non-trivial? Well, in the first case, the topologically trivial case, it's easy to see that this Hamiltonian uh, has a unique gapped ground state. So the ground state is unique because these CID heights here all take values plus or minus one. And so of course the ground state is just obtained by sticking them all to be minus one. Okay, this is the unique ground state here. And there's a gap because if I want to go to the next excited state, I have to flip one of the minus ones to plus one. So the energy cost of doing so is non-zero. Um, even if I went to infinite volume, so it's always just two. All right, whereas on the other hand, in the topologically non-trivial phase, uh, there's actually not a unique ground state anymore. There's a twofold degeneracy in the ground state. 
Okay, so now the ground state uh, turns out to be uh, this. Okay, and this comes about because these d i c i plus ones, as it turns out, also take values only plus or minus one. So I minimize the energy by taking them all to be minus one. But the catch is that in this case, the term i d n c one does not appear in the Hamiltonian because the lattice is not periodic. Okay, so there's actually a twofold degeneracy corresponding to this choice in the uh, choice of the ground state. Okay, so this is always a feature of these uh, non-trivial SPT phases that there's some ground state energy which can be interpreted as being due to some di dangling, uh, in this case, Majorana edge modes, but generically some edge modes. Um, so in this case, the sort of hallmark of the non-trivial phase is the fact that I have these Majoranas, uh, which are free at the, at the end of this chain. Okay, and these two things are topologically distinct phases um, for what I just said, and also because one cannot be continuously deformed to the other. Can I ask a question? Yes, please. Uh, how does a condensed matter experimentalist engineer this Hamiltonian? That is a good question, and I can't answer that, <laughs> how, how you would actually do it physically. Um, yeah. Um, can you tell me what the dimension of the Hilbert space is at site one in your original chain and in your split chain? At site one here? Uh, yes, so you, have, you had your original chain with your complex fermions. Uh, oh. on the top left, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. and then you had your second chain with the Majorana fermion. So can you tell me what the dimension is of the Hilbert space at site one in, in both cases? Um, yes, yeah, so in the first case, it would seem to be two. Whereas in the second case, it would seem to be four. So, so they're not equivalent, right? After you split. Um, yes, yes, that's right. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. Good. Okay, so, um, so hopefully this lattice picture is clear. Are there any other lattice questions that I can attempt to answer? Okay, good. I'm not an expert on the lattice either. <laughs> so now we're going to pass to the continuum, fortunately. <clears throat> so let's talk about the continuum realization of this lattice phase. So we're going to pass to the continuum where this lattice becomes a sheet of added time in the vertical direction. You could think of this like an open string world sheet. Um, and we actually don't have to focus on, on the sheet. We can talk about the torus, any Riemann surface, what I'm about to say is, is the same. So I told you before that in this fancy math language, the thing which classifies the SPT phases would be omega d s b g. Okay, so let's try and uh, figure out what this is right now, or at least what the relevant group is for us right now. So clearly we're looking at a d is equal to two system. Now, because this lattice with the Majorana fermions is lifted to some uh, spinners on uh, this continuum picture, we expect that the structure that we should have is, is at least spin structure. And there's no real other symmetry in play in this, in this picture. There was no other G bundle. So uh, we're gonna set G to zero. So the relevant group to study is omega two spin point. And this thing can be computed uh, to be Z2. Okay, so the way we should interpret this is that the trivial element of this Z2 corresponds to this trivial phase. The non-trivial element of this Z2 corresponds to this non-trivial phase. Okay, and the fact that it's actually a, a Z2 means that if I stack two copies of this non-trivial phase, I should get the trivial phase. And indeed, it can be shown that that's possible. 
basically because I can couple the dangling edge modes uh, between the two copies of the chain. Uh, how can you see that uh, there is cobordism relevant here? Um, so, right. So the way that you see it, so it is basically just by this statement here. So uh, you know that the partition function has to map you to an element of U1 and the SPT phase only depends on the bordism class. Oh, are you asking, how do I know that the SPT phase only depends on the bordism class? Yes. Uh, okay, so this is actually not trivial. The one thing I can say is that if you're writing a topological action for such a theory, basically the only things you can use are Pontryagin classes and stiefel whitney classes, which are bordism invariants. Uh, there's an exception, which yes, is- Yes, but the, qu the question not. is, in the lattice model you made, why is it topological? Why is it taught just from the point of view of the lattice? Um, yeah. I mean, you have a system. Why, do, how can you see that it's only the topological information that's relevant here? In particular, the cobordism information. Um, And for Riemann surfaces, the only cobordism invariant is the genus anyway, right? Unless you put some extra structure like the spin structure. Yeah, that's right. We, I mean, we will always have extra structure though. Right, but I don't see even the, the, the Riemann surface coming in. For the moment, I just have a chain. And if you put time, you have, you know, a, a sheet. Where does the rest come from? Um, No, that's a, uh, yeah. We can skip this for the end. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Let me think for one more second though. Okay, let me think about it more and, and come back to it, sorry. Mm -hmm. Okay, um, good. So, sorry, let me see. Okay, uh, good. So for the minute, let's, um, let's take this non-trivial SPT phase that I introduced and, and just run with it. So uh, as I said before, the partition function of this, of this phase should uh, give you some element of U1, okay? Um, in particular, it's, it's a, a map from the bordism class of X to some element of U1. And in the particular uh, system that I just told you about, it turns out that this partition function is given by something called the ARF invariant. This you can think of basically as the mod two index of a Dirac operator, but the precise definition of this thing is not going to be super important for us. Instead, I'm just going to tell you what this partition function evaluates to on the various manifolds that we're going to be interested in. Okay, so, uh, we're going to be interested in tori with various spin structures. So let me just tell you that this partition function evaluates as follows. So on the NSNS torus, it evaluates to one. On the RNS and NSR tori, it likewise evaluates to one. And on the RR torus, it evaluates to minus one. Okay, and hopefully at this point, it becomes a little bit clear why this is going to be relevant for string theory, if we go back to this picture here, we saw that the difference between say type 2a and type 2b was that I could choose some phases, but uh, the way that I could choose them was that they always had to be one for the NSNS, NSR, and RNS tori, but it could potentially be minus one for the RR tori. In other words, this phase alpha here that I had uh, was really just this factor of the R from there. And this now gives rise to an alternative interpretation of this GSO projection, whereby I get rid of these phases in the sum. So I just say for type 2A and type 2B, I'm doing the same spin structure sum, not weighted with this extra stuff, but I modify the actual partition, or sorry, the actual Lagrangian or action of one of the two theories, type 2A, with an extra factor of this R there. Okay, so 
this other sort of point of view would say that the world sheet theories of type 2a and type 2b actually differ. And they differ by this sort of subtle topological term, which then gives rise to these phases in this spin structure sum. Okay, so let me just repeat what I just said for type zero strings. So the main thing that sets type zero strings apart from type two strings is that I identify the spin structures for left and right movers. So I just have one spin structure sum here. And then the difference between type zero B and type zero A is the presence of the same factor of minus one in the RR sector. And I can now move this phase into the sort of say partition functions themselves, by which I mean I can just absorb this RF invariant into the definition of the world sheet action for type zero A. And that's an alternative interpretation of this whole GSO projection story. Okay, so now why is this new language useful? Well, this new language is useful because it's easily generalizable, say to the case of original interest, which I said was going to be unoriented type zero strings. So let's consider type zero strings whose world sheets are unoriented. I have two choices for the structure on the world sheet. If I wanna put fermions on an unoriented world sheet, then generically I have the option of pin minus and pin plus structure. And now I can consider SPT phases I can put on a world sheet with pin minus or pin plus structure. Those are classified by these relevant dual bordism groups. And this evaluates to Z8, this one evaluates to Z2. So we would conclude at first sight that we should have 10 different unoriented type zero strings. Okay, and their world sheet theories all differ by some topological terms which are given by the generators of these bordism groups. So in this case, it's something which is known as the ABK invariant. In this case, it's basically the same RF invariant that we had encountered before. All right, so um, this provides a way to classify strings. We just see all of the possible uh, SPT phases we can add to the world sheet theory. Um, and in fact, this SPT phase point of view doesn't just tell us about the classification of the theories themselves, but also allows us to classify the objects in those theories. So um, for example, it allows us uh, a nice world sheet re-derivation of the common statement that K-theory classifies different brands in uh, say type 2A and type 2B. So uh, sorry, can I ask a question? So yes. the types of theories you're discussing now have a closed and an open string sector? Yes. And the closed string sector is type zero? So, say it again. The closed, the string, closed sector string sector is type zero? The closed string sector is type zero. Um, you, yeah, you mean for these. Mm -hmm. Right. So these, these uh, uh, choices then apply to the open sector, right? These projections. Or also to the closed string sector. No, no, yeah. All strings are expected to have these same uh, these same thing terms. Yeah. Okay. Uh -huh. Yeah. So you only see, for the most part, the interesting effects of these terms when you consider open strings, just because then you actually have boundaries on your string world sheet, and that's where you get the interesting edge modes that we had seen before. And it's exactly those edge modes. So, for example, in type 2A versus type 2B, I had these Majorana edge modes. And that extra Majorana edge mode at the end of open strings uh, in, in type 2A, say, uh, give rise to some extra Clifford bundle structure, which then changes the classification of brains from K theory to K1 theory. So therefore, if I compute scattering amplitudes involving only closed strings, they're exactly the same as type 0. Right? Um, oh, I'm sorry. I, I understand what you're saying. So you're, you're asking if these are op closed open string theories in the same sense as type one, not in the sense of are there D brains with open strings? No, no. So you're asking if there are D9 brains in these theories, yeah. right? Yeah. Uh, so no, the answer is no. So these are closed string theories. Yes, sorry, I misunderstood. Okay, so of course, there are brains in them, and you can talk about open strings on those brains. But yeah, there are no world, uh, sorry, space-time filling okay. brains in these theories. 
So they have a, di a different clustering spectrum uh, depending. Yeah, yeah that, that's right. That's right. Mm -hmm. Yes, um, indeed. Okay. Um, great. So what time? I started at nine, right? Okay. So um, another half half hour, roughly. <laughs> perfect. Okay, great. So um, actually, I'm going to go ahead and close this part of the talk then and move on to the second part of the talk. I think it's good timing. So are there any other questions on 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 uh, the previous part? Among, yes. these 10, among, sorry, among these 10 models, is one of them tachyon free uh, in, in terms of closed tachyons or are they all tachyon? Oh, uh, yes. So the uh, pin plus cases are actually tachyon free. Um, so the eight pin, actually, I think I have this written down somewhere. Yeah, so the pin minus strings here have closed string tachyons, but the pin plus ones do not. So the spectrum of these closed string theories is different from the standard type zero uh, closed strings, right? Yes. And the difference is not only on the deep brains that you have. Is that correct? Uh, so that's right. So um, yes, that's right. So you will have some spectrum of, for example, RR form fields. And you can basically tell what the spectrum of RR form fields is going to be by at least looking at the non-torsion brains in, in this, these various tables that I have here. And the non-torsion brains are all different. That means these theories are going to have different spectra of RR form fields. OK, thank you. Mm -hmm. But they have no gravitational anomalies. Yes, that's right. Yeah. Good. Great. Any, any other questions? Okay, uh, great. Thank you for all of the questions. So I'm going to then move on to part two of the talk. So we've identified various um, non-supersymmetric string theories. Many of them are going to have closed string tachyons. And now I would like to ask if you can somehow condense or get rid of these closed string tachyons in some way uh, and identify some stable or at least metastable really, uh, uh, lower dimensional vacua. Okay, and I'm going to do this in the context of non-supersymmetric heterotic strings, actually, because that's the more interesting case. Okay, so having said that, let me introduce the heterotic strings in question. And actually, I realize at this point that I probably should have added some extra citations here, so let me cite a paper by Kawai, Lewellen, and Tai from, I think, 86 where they first identified these theories that I'm about to tell you about, and also a roughly contemporaneous paper by I think Dixon and Harvey, uh, also 86. Okay, and of course, there are some others as well. So actually, I'm not going to follow their construction because uh, I think that in hindsight, there's a slicker construction. So uh, let me just introduce these theories for you. So um, there are going to be six tachyonic heterotic string theories, and we can build them as follows. So the world sheet fields that we have are there's going to be some left and right moving bosons, left moving super partners to the bosons on the left. And on the right, we have a bosonic string. So I'm going to have an extra 16 bosons, which I can fermionize to 32 right moving fermions. Okay, and now I'm just going to write down the simplest partition function I could possibly think of, which is, uh, so I have this dedicated function that captures the contribution from the bosons, and then I just identify the spin structures between all of the fermions. Okay, so here's the eight left moving fermions, and here's the 32 right moving fermion contributions. Okay, so you can write this thing out in terms of theta functions. And you can just uh, go ahead and look at its Q expansion. So the level match terms in the Q expansion look like this. So there's a 32 Q, Q bar minus one half here. And there's a uh, plus 4,032 plus dot, dot, dot. So what this tells you is that there are 32 tachyons. And there will be 4,032 massless bosons, which correspond to a graviton, B field, and diloton in 10D. 
as well as 496 gauge bosons of SO32. So the partition function that I just wrote down for you is a tentative partition function for a non-supersymmetric SO32 heterotic string attendee. And now one can go from this theory. Sorry, are you, you're not summing independently left and right uh, spin structures, right? No, they're, yeah, it's the same spin structure on the left and the right. Everything has the same spin structure for this one. Okay. Mm -hmm. Great. Um, okay, good. So given this theory, we can go ahead and obtain other theories in the following way. We can notice that this theory here has a Z2 to the fifth global symmetry. Okay, this global symmetry is generated by these five Z2 elements here. Each one of them just looks like a poly sigma three matrix tensored with a bunch of the identity matrices such that I get a 32 by 32 dimensional matrix in total. Okay, and this 32 by 32 dimensional matrix acts on these fermions here um, in like a vector representation. Okay, so since they're just built out of poly sigma three and a bunch of ones, of course, each of these generators here acts as minus one on half of the fermions and as plus one on the others. Okay, and now I can go ahead and gauge some subset of this Z2 symmetry. Okay, so in particular, I can gauge Z2 to the N for N between zero and five. Now, when I do so, of course, I expect to break the space-time gauge group SO32 because uh, I'm now treating these 32 fermions unequally. Um, and so this is the breaking pattern. So two to the five minus N counts the number of fermions which are left invariant under the Z2 to the N action that I'm gauging. Okay, so the upshot of, of doing this gauging is that you'll get a bunch of different theories. You can just explicitly write down their partition functions and see that uh, they'll have these spectrum of tachyons for gauging zero through five copies. They'll have this spectrum of massless fermions and they'll have these gauge groups. Okay, or really I'm only talking at the level of the algebra. I'm not worried about global structure here. So uh, they'll have these gauge algebras say. Are those chiral fermions? Um, so in some cases, yes. In some cases, yes. And in some cases, no. So for example, here, yes, it's just one, let's say right moving fermion in the adjoint to the eight. Nonetheless, there are no gravitational anomalies in these models? Yes, that's right. Mm -hmm. And this will actually be non-trivial. Well, I'll come back to that, but yes. Great. Okay, so very good. Um, oh, and one thing I wanted to point out on this slide is that the number of tachyons here, you can see is suggestive. It turns out that the tachyons are always in the vector representation of this SO2 to the five minus N. So in this case, SO32, in this case, O16, O8, here uh, O4, which is SU2 squared, and then here there's an O2 under which these transform as a, as a vector. Okay, very good. So we have some set of six tachyonic heterotic string theories. And now we're going to go ahead and condense the tachyon. And here we're just going to follow previous work by Hellerman and Swanson where they did this condensation for the case of E8. Here we're just going to try and, and uh, extend it to these other cases here. All right, so um, when I condense the tachyon, I'll generate some super potential for the tachyon. Uh, so this is the tachyon profile here. A here is a vector index for SO2 to the five minus N. And basically the only one comma zero super potential I can write down is uh, the one which is shown here. So I chose some subset of the fermions, in particular a subset which uh, is left unchanged um, by, by this Z2 to the N. And uh, I wrote down, okay, so this is the super potential term I have. Now I want to explicitly plug in some expression for the tachyon profile here. So to do so, I'm gonna to turn to the equations of motion for the tachyon. Okay, which are given as shown here. You see phi appearing here. Phi is the dilaton that I have. 
Um, and so one solution to these equations of motion is I can take the dilaton to have a linear dilaton profile where it's linear in one of the light cone coordinates. And then I can take the tachyon to be exponential in a different light cone coordinate and to be linear in the spatial coordinates. Okay, so every component of the tachyon is linear in a different spatial coordinate. So you can just plug this in and check that it's a, a, a solution to these equations of motion. And actually by some magic that I won't have time to, to discuss, uh, it turns out that these are actually alpha prime exact solutions to the string equations of motion. So I have a basic confusion here. The, yes. the spray potential is, is, is fermionic. This lambda twiddle A was a fermion in target space? Yes. Mm -hmm. What's the meaning of a, of a fermionic superpotential here? Sorry, isn't this a perturbation of, of the Waldschild theory? Yes, yes. Th this is a superpotential on the Waldschild. Oh, sorry. Okay. Mm -hmm. Yeah, right. Right. And the Waldschild has 2,0 supersymmetry, which allows for such superpotentials. Right? So, sorry, say it again. The watch it has 2,0 or 0,2 supersymmetry allowing for such a spec potential. Yes, yes, exactly. It's a, well, yeah, I had said 1,0 before, I guess. Oh, one, one, yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. Sorry. No, uh -huh. no, no. no. Uh, good. Okay. Um, great. Uh, so I think I was saying, yeah, so we have these solutions and uh, now we can go ahead and stick them into this super potential and then integrate along the super space coordinate. And when I do so, I'll get some scalar potential. And that scalar potential looks as shown here. So, uh, good. So what are the salient features of this uh, scalar potential? So I see that I generate a mass for spatial coordinates in particular, every spatial coordinate, coordinate which uh, appears in this tachyon profile here, so one for each component of the tachyon, gets a mass. Uh, and that mass is proportional to the exponential of this light cone coordinate x plus. Likewise, I generate a mass for the superpartners as well. So now as x plus goes to infinity, so at late light cone times, the fluctuations in the uh, spatial coordinates which appear here uh, are going to be suppressed. And we're actually going to get a theory in uh, 10 minus uh, this total uh, two to the five minus n directions. Okay, so at late light cone times, we've transitioned now to a theory in lower dimensions. And so in particular, in the cases of three, four and five um, gaugings of the Z2, then we get a theory in respectively six, eight, and nine dimensions with some spectrum of fermions, which can be chiral, and also with some uh, gauge groups. Okay, so we've identified here some lower dimensional uh, string vacua. And now what we can do are the usual games that we like to play. For example, we can go to the low energy effective action here. So instead of being a super gravity, because these are non susie strings, it's just a gravity theory coupled to some gauge fields. And we can check for perturbative and global anomaly cancellation, uh, just like we usually do. Can, can um, I ask a question? Yes, yes. So after a tachyon condensation, the result is a non-supersymmetric uh, string theory, right? It was non-supersymmetric before as well, but yes, it's also non-supersymmetric after. Right. So. Like I, I would anticipate naively that after a tachyon condensation, you will land on some uh, supersymmetric vacuum. Let, let me explain why. There is an interesting paper by Kutasov and Zyberg from the early 90s, in which they claim that the closed string tachyon has a significance in, in terms of, um, it's a UV IR relation that a tachyon uh, can be translated via modular invariance into the asymptotic form of the tower. So at least you should expect like asymptotic supersymmetry between uh, uh, bosonic and fermionic tower. So you see what I, I'm saying? I'm saying that asymptotically in the UV, uh, mm -hmm. you need some sort of supersymmetry that by, and this supersymmetry means no tachyon. 
And if there is a tachyon, then there is uh, no supersymmetry. So the, the infrared the, or the lower energy, the tachyon has a significance in terms of asymptotic form of the... But Adi, as shown by Dines, even non-supersymmetric theories, asymptotically, they have supersymmetric um, uh, degeneracies. Right, right, right. So this is exactly, Elias, that's exactly my, my question. I'm not asking whether these theories- But that's compatible are... with what uh, Justin is saying. Yeah, so that's my question to Justin, whether at least you have some sort of asymptotic supersymmetry, not necessarily asymptotic. That's actually my question. Yeah, so, um... So for the lower dimensional cases, I am not actually sure. I have not checked this. Um, it, is some, it is some sort of consistency check of, of your proposal. So. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah, I'm not actually familiar with this work of, of Kutasov and Zyberg, so I'll, I'll look into it. Um, yeah. I, I, I will write it in the chat. OK, fantastic. Thank you. Great. Um, okay, good. H how are we doing on time, by the way? It, did time just end? Uh, uh, no, we have another uh, up to 15 minutes. Um, uh, fantastic. Okay, great. Uh, are there any other questions at this point? Okay, good. Um, so uh, we're almost done here. So, uh, right. So we just found uh, lower dimensional mm, vacua for the n is equal to three, four, and five cases. Uh, recall in total that, uh, of course, there were six of these. So uh, let me now talk about the n is equal to zero, one, and two cases. Okay, and so briefly, uh, well, at least for n is less than two, what I said on the previous slide cannot be correct because the dimension formula that I had gave would naively give you negative dimension. So that doesn't make much sense. But in these cases, what we can actually do is just condense down to two dimensions. Um, and in two dimensions, we would naively have some components of the tachyon, which remain uncondensed, which haven't had a potential generated for them yet. But actually in 2D, the interaction with the dilaton background uh, will lift the mass of the tachyon, as it turns out, and the tachyon will become massless. It will no longer uh, indicate an instability. So um, in these cases, we can get uh, stable two-dimensional vacua with some spectra of massless bosons and fermions in some gauge groups. And in fact, these two-dimensional theories, these three 2D heterotic theories are exactly the three 2D heterotic theories that were known in the literature previously. Okay, so um, in this way, we've obtained some dynamical transition, some solution which describes a dynamical transition between the tachyonic heterotic string theories labeled by n is equal to zero, one, and two, and the 2D heterotic string theories that were known. Okay, so this provides a nice uh, connection in that sort of big enlarged quote-unquote duality web that I had drawn before. And the tachyon solutions in this case look similar to what you had before? Yeah, they're in fact exactly the same, except I just don't write. Uh, so I take only eight of the tachyon components to have this form and the others to just be zero. Actually, I'm a bit surprised why you have um, you make contact with only three heterotic strings in, in two dimensions. Uh, given that, as Elias pointed out, there are, there are thousands of them in four dimensions, right? Uh, That's yeah. What about those three? So because he's not touching the metric. Sorry, could you say that again? Uh, that's because, of course, there are many more uh, solutions to the tachyon, so they can condense elsewhere. But mm -hmm. to find many more solutions and to get contact with also the four-dimensional solutions, you have to start changing also the metric at the same time. And of course, that's much more complicated. You're looking at very special tachyon solutions. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. No, but forget the issue of tachyon condensation. In two dimensions, there must be many uh, heterotic strings without tachyons. Uh, non supersymmetric ones without tachyons, isn't that uh, true? 
I think it usually claimed that these are the only subject to. No, there may be there may be many more, but they don't have to be endpoints of tachyon condensation of ten-dimensional solutions. Nobody can guarantee this. Okay, I just wonder what, uh, why Davis, Larson, Zyber picked on those particular three, but okay, we can keep it for later. The claim in these papers is that um, yeah, if you want a 2D flat space solution, these are the only three options. So that's 2D with dilaton profile. 2D Minkowski with dilaton profile or just purely 2D? Uh, yeah, so sorry, let me just try to uh, recall how exactly they show this. I think there must be other, other uh, assumptions because if you take any of the third dimensional solutions and you compactify on a torus, they're automatically uh, two dimensional, they are thousands. Yeah, that was my point. <laughs> if you compactify on a torus. Um... Anyway, I think. Yeah, so the reason that they only find these is because um, they want to compactify the right moving bosons on a, I guess, 24 dimensional even self dual lattice, or sorry, 12 dimensional even self dual lattice, of which these are the only possibilities. Um, That's already very restrictive. Mm -hmm. If you compactify the theoretic string on a torus, then the dilaton can be, has to be constant. It's not this linear dilaton situation. Yes, but I thought that here it's constant, right? Or not? So, no, no in this case, system. we have a linear dilaton always. Oh, I see. Mm -hmm. Great. This is supposed to be a truly non uh, string in two dimension, not the compactification of something in higher dimension. Oh yeah, okay, so that's a good point. Yes, so indeed, uh, we're talking about intrinsically 2D string theories here. Mm -hmm. Okay, good. Um, are there any other questions that I can deflect? <laughs> okay, great. Uh, so yeah, let me just conclude then. Uh, good, I think we're right on time. So um, this, part, uh, this talk had two parts. So in the first part of the talk, we discussed how the world sheet theories of different strings can differ by some uh, subtle topological terms, and that these terms explained various things like the uh, different GSO projections, D brain spectra, and oriental foldings allowed in the theories. Okay. And we, in particular, classified the different or uh, unoriented type zero strings. And then in the second part of the talk, we saw that uh, tachyonic strings can admit lower dimensional stable vacua. And in some cases, these lower dimensional stable vacua were known two dimensional strings. Okay, so what are some possible future extensions here? So actually in this talk, I haven't said anything about putting SPT phases on heterotic world sheets. And this is actually uh, a whole interesting project in itself, which is underway. So just to, give you a hint of what sort of things you can find here. You just have to look at the size of this relevant Bordism group and it's pretty huge, which tells you that there's a lot of possibilities there. Uh, a second thing you could consider is world sheet domain walls between topologically trivial and non-trivial phases. Okay, so uh, for example, you could consider a world sheet domain wall between type 2A and type 2B strings. This is a pretty interesting object. And finally, you could reinterpret old results from orbifolding literature about discrete torsion in terms of these SPT phases and then try to go beyond it, like we did for oriental. Okay, so um, yeah, let me just close by saying nowadays, 
Uh, there's a lot of effort put towards non-perturbative string theory, which is great and very well merited. But I think even in perturbative string theory, there remains a lot of simple but fun things to explore. So thank you guys for having me. Okay, thank you so much, Justin. Uh, we can clap virtually or not. <laughs> and, uh, and let's take uh, more questions. Maybe, maybe I can ask uh, a question about type zero unoriented strings. In principle, these were classified by Sagnotti a long time ago. And in 10 dimensions, he found three, for example, for type zero B, he found three different classes which are corresponding to three different oriental projections. Mm -hmm. We talked about 10. Yeah, indeed. So these, uh, Sagnati's classification was not uh, complete, I would say. So which ones had been identified here? So let's see where I should write it. Okay, so here we found, I'm just gonna write it here. So here we found some pin plus string theories and then eight pin minus string theories. Now the eight pin minus string theories can be, so there's eight of these and then there's, there's two of these. So the eight pin minus string theories can be interpreted roughly as follows. So um, unlike in type two strings where I can only do an oriental folding for, for type two uh, B, uh, in this case, I can start with type zero A or type zero B, and I can go ahead and do an oriental folding. So this gives me two theories. Uh, so this omega represents the fact that I'm gauging omega, which I'm interpreting to be world sheet parity. Now, an alternative thing I could do actually, is I could go ahead and I can gauge omega times some extra Z2 element minus one to the F left, where this is space time fermion number, left moving fermion number. And I can likewise gauge the same thing in zero B. So now I have a total of four theories out of eight. And then the difference between these four that I just wrote and the other four to give the total of eight is like these ones um, are basically like the analog of O9 minuses. And then if I had the analog of O9 pluses, I would get the other four. So the real difference between the two is the fact that oh, okay. omega acts different on the on the bundles, the Chan pattern bundles. But okay. uh, yeah, so that's the intuitive explanation for the eight pin minus theories. And for the pin plus theories, uh, I again get the two by starting with zero A or zero B and now gauging omega minus one to the little f left where this is now world sheet fermion, left moving fermion number as opposed to space time that we had before. And likewise here. Okay. So it's using both kind of O9s, okay, probably. Because for the rest, he... he... Oh, so what Sagnati, the ones that Sagnati identified was he identified one of these pin plus theories. And then he identified, uh, well, we can say, say these two. Actually, I don't remember if it was this one or this one that he identified, but uh, in any he case... Had, he, had, uh, he, he did combine Omega with... Uh, uh, yeah, so I think he the... must have had this one too. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yes. Okay. Thank you. Mm -hmm. So, have you worked out the spectra of all of these theories in the Ramon Ramon sector? Yes. Uh, th these ones, yes. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yes. I think this is interesting because um, uh, QCD, the string theory of QCD, is expected to be a type zero super string, I mean, like type zero super string theory, but the standard type zero theories, of course, don't have the right structure of Ramon-Ramon fields. So it would be interesting to check the spectra of these theories to what extent they may come closer to what you would expect for uh, uh, young males. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. That is interesting. Yeah, that's, that's a great idea. Mm -hmm. Other questions? In, in the in the outline, the outline you said, mm. yes. any yeah, questions? Okay, is it okay? Yeah, that's okay. Uh -huh. Before you leave, oh, sorry, I don't know. But so, in in the outline, you say you wanted to look at the SPT phases of the worksheet, heterotic worksheets. I thought this is what you were doing. Ah, so uh, no. Uh, good question. So what I did here 
was um, I started with, let's say this, this SPT, oh, sorry, not <laughs> this partition function. Mm -hmm. And then what I did is I did various gaugings of the partition function. So what that means is that I could, uh, I took the torus and so I had some sum over G and H. So previously I had some sum over G and H where G and H were minus one to the F lines, which was just a sum over spin structure. Mm -hmm. But now I could also sum of course over uh, elements of some of some group, in this case, say Z2 to the N. And so this is just a sum over now twisted sectors and, and say twine sectors. Um, and now what I could do, so this is just gauging various things. It's like introducing more independent spin structures. But if I wanted to add SPT phases, what I have to do is I have to consider adding extra uh, phases into this sum here. So extra discrete torsion into the gaugings of these Z2s. And that I haven't done. So here I just gauged these Z2s without worrying about any possible discrete torsion. Okay. Okay. And so the point, so what I was saying before was that if I gauge the full say Z2 to the fifth symmetry, I can add discrete torsions, that is to say these phases into the sum uh, over the group elements. And the point is that there are 65,000 consistent choices of discrete torsion you could add. I see. And so each of those, at least in principle, uh, would give a, a distinct theory. You have to check, maybe there are some overlaps. But, yeah. but you, what do you expect? You, you expect to have... Well, so at first it seems like not all of them are distinct, uh, but it seems I have no mechanism that I know of which would actually make all of them identical. And it seems that some of them are distinct. Yeah, so we haven't really been able to fully tell if they're all distinct or not. Mm -hmm. I see. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Other questions? Uh, can I ask you also another question? I'm confused a little bit. You take, let's say, a tachyon solution, which solves the string equations of motion, and then mm -hmm. you essentially modify your world sheet theory. Now, since you solve the equations of motion, your world sheet theory is still a conformal field theory. But as you mentioned, some of the world volume fields, some of the coordinates of the string, uh, look massive. Now. Mm -hmm. Uh, you're saying they're decoupled, but how would they decouple if you're, you have a conformal field theory? Are you changing the central charge somehow? Why the, the yes. sum of the coordinates decouple? Yes, exactly. That's, so that's what, hap that's what happens. So you integrate out the coordinates, say, and they decouple. And what that does is it shifts the central charge. But uh, the beautiful thing is that when you do this integrating out, you seemingly shift the central charge contribution from, from you know, scalar field state. But when you do this integrating out, you also change the, dil the dilaton profile. And this ends up changing the central charge contribution from the dilaton such that the full central charge remains zero. But how so do you know that, that you can you integrate them out since the analog of the mass is field dependent? Yeah, sorry, say it one more time. So how do you know that you can integrate out, let's say, what looks like massive if the analog of the mass is field dependent, depends on X plus? Ah, right, so the integrating out is only valid in some region. Uh, so it's, it's valid in the region where I'm at large light cone times. So the sort of picture to have in mind is, uh, so I imagine some, say, bubble of this lower dimensional vacuum forming. And the region that we're studying is this region of the bubble here, which is at X plus goes to infinity. And so in this region here, it's sensible to talk about. Uh, getting oh, I see, I see, I see, I see, I see, thank you. Mm -hmm. I have one question, which is a bit orthogonal to your talk, but um, where does the heterotic SO16 cross SO16 string fit in the in the web of uh, supersymmetric string theories? Can you yeah, great. So, um, good. So here I gave you a list of uh, six different tachyonic heterotic strings. In total, um, in 10D, the ones which are usually considered, are, there's a total of seven of them. 
so in addition to the six I just told you about, the 016016 heterotic string is also, it also exists, um, but it has no tachyon, which is why I didn't uh, discuss it. So the way that it fits into this sort of construction that I gave here, so I gave this construction in terms of gauging Z2 to the fifth, et cetera. So actually, uh, the header, so the 016, 016 is not obtained in this way. Rather, it's obtained by doing exactly what I said here, which is adding discrete torsion. So the one case where discrete torsion has actually been added and taken into account is the 016 cross 016 case. Yeah, so there they have some non trivial alphas. See, I guess my question was more uh, how is it related to others by, by dualities or transitions? Ah, okay, so actually, okay, so then the 016 cross 016 is one of the few which even from the old days was actually brought into this duality web. So there are some connections to it, which I'm not going to be able to reproduce off the top of my head, but uh, yeah, I can refer you to, to papers in the literature if you're interested. All right, thanks. Any okay. other questions? One, also one related question. Uh, so for example, the tachyons that you condense and uh, you obtain these connections in this case are always from the 10 dimensions, right? So they always, uh, if you were to compactify first, let's say, on a circle, and you went to nine dimensions of the O16 or cross O16 that Boris mentioned, for example, then you get, uh, I mean, if you play with the moduli of the heterotic theory in this case, you can create uh, tachyons, and the tachyon mass will be dependent highly on the moduli that you, on the point of perturbative moduli space that you go to. Could you somehow play this game also in this case, or is it outside the scope for now? Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's a good question. Um, yeah, um, I don't have anything concrete to say about that. I think that the, so the same onsets for the, so this same onsets here would no longer work in that case, I think. Um, and if that's the case, then I don't have anything contrary to say. So the nice thing about this onsets is that it actually is alpha prime exact. And that's highly dependent on taking this exact form of this, of this solution. Uh, if I change it, there's no, reason to, so yeah, the proof that these things are alpha prime exact is, is sort of very heavily reliant on this particular form. Right. Yeah, so yeah, I don't have anything concrete to say about that. Okay, thanks. Okay, so I suggest we, put, we make this the official end of the talk and we can continue discussing on Zoom for as long as we wish, but let's uh, thank again, uh, Justin for the very nice talk. Thank you guys.